One of the facts that continuously bedevils the rationalist is that while there may be a limited number of ways to achieve any given outcome, there are an infinite number of ways to pretend to achieve it, which is why we're going to never run out of topics for How Bullshit Is It? So tell us, Heath, what defecatory delusion did you bring for us today? Today, we're going to be talking about aromatherapy. Oh, good. So we started the alphabet over. We did, yes. All right, all right. So what is aromatherapy? It's the idea that you can cure disease with smells. Oh, all right. But isn't that like... Right on the nose. Isn't that the <laughs> classical example of dumb shit they thought back in the days of the bubonic plague? It is, yes. But unlike real medicine, alternative medicine practitioners generally see antiquity as a good thing. So the fact that the whole concept was considered cutting-edge medicine in the 14th century... It's both strong evidence that it's definitely wrong and that it's a great selling point for these people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the prevailing theory back in the 1300s was that disease was caused by bad air, which isn't entirely wrong, and that you could cure or prevent disease by chasing off the bad air with strong smells, which is entirely wrong. Okay, but it would explain why I've never gotten COVID, hmm. right? My secret... Always eating a Cinnabon. <laughs> it also sounds like something Herschel Walker would say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so back then, they didn't really distinguish between good and bad smells for these purposes. We usually think of, you know, the pocket full of posies or the huge reservoir of incense in the plague doctor masks as ways to mask the smell of corpses. But in reality, people held flowers to their face because they thought it would fumigate their lungs. Huh. They also used strong smells to fumigate their homes and even their streets. And while the image of the latter in the public consciousness is usually of strong offensive odors in the streets, you have to consider that we're talking about the streets of 14th century towns. Basically, you were covering up the smell of drunkard urine and horse shit, so mm. I doubt anything they were burning smelled worse than the air they were trying to chase off. I mean, we all used to live in New York City, Heath. We get yeah, it. Yeah, right, You're right. No, exactly. <laughs> All right, so I doubt very seriously that today's aromatherapists tie their practice to, like, plague prevention in medieval Europe. So, uh, so where did they start the story? Much earlier. The use of therapeutic smells goes as far back as written history and then some. Incense has been used in religious rituals for millennia, and the distinction between medical and spiritual use is pretty recent. So aromatherapists will point out that ancient Egyptians were using smells therapeutically in 2500 B.C., and that you can find similar practices all over the world, which is true. And as your recent pardon from Joe Biden confirms, Noah, <laughs> a lot of medicines can be inhaled through their smoke. Uh -huh. So yeah, yeah, yeah. if the incense you're burning happens to be, say, cannabis or opium, there actually is a therapeutic effect. It just doesn't come from the smell. Yeah, I just like the smell is the, I'm just reading the articles of opium right, use. Right, right. <laughs> it does smell fantastic. Okay, so when we talk about aromatherapy, we're obviously not talking about smoking opium. You weren't. But, <laughs> so, it does smell great. It, it, yeah. So, okay, so how do aromatherapists distinguish between what they do and the use of oils or inhalants for other therapeutic purposes? Well, to whatever degree possible, they don't. When you point out, for example, that there's no good medical evidence that aromatherapy can prevent or cure any disease, aromatherapy's best defense is to blur the lines between aromatherapy and some legitimate medical practice. So it's really hard to draw a dividing line that all aromatherapists would agree on. Oh, how purposely deceptive. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're just getting warmed up. Okay, so setting aside this bullshit appeal to antiquity that they used to justify their existence, where does the history of aromatherapy really start? Well, the term aromatherapy first appears in a French book from 1937 called Aromatherapie, les huiles essentielles, hormones végétales by René-Maurice Gatfossé, a chemist who claimed he cured a severe burn on his hand with lavender oil. Okay, but by like, by smelling the lavender oil? <laughs> as far as I can tell, yes. But... It's tricky because aromatherapists like to tie in topical application of oils into their thing without telling you. So it may also be that he just rubbed lavender oil on his burn. Well, but so how can applying an oil topically be considered aromatherapy? Because you can still smell it. Really? <laughs> really, yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> now I'm picturing a very different version of the scene from Fight Club with the chemical burn. <laughs> right. In this hand, I have a lavender oil. All right. So, so what does aromatherapy do? Well, according to resources like Johns Hopkins, WebMD, the Cleveland Clinic, aromatherapy can reduce anxiety, improve sleep, and help you relax. I see, I see. But what does BoomBoomNaturals.com think, According to, great question, Eli. According to BoomBoomNaturals.com, <laughs> I guess you have that bookmark too. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yep. Next to Yik Yak. They can boost energy, reduce pain, and balance your hormone levels. What? And depending on how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go, you can find aromatherapists claiming that it can prevent colds, treat burns, eliminate varicose veins, and reduce the symptoms of cancer. Huh. There's also the omnipresent and ultimately meaningless assertion that it can boost your immune system. And you'll find that claim pretty much everywhere with a financial interest in selling essential oils. Okay, so I, I, apologies if this is a stupid question, but what exactly is an essential oil? It's an yeah. oil you just can't do without. Sorry, Heath, him and his questions. <laughs> so well, stupid. According to Wikipedia, an essential oil is, quote, a concentrated hydrophobic liquid containing volatile chemical compounds from plants. So basically, it's the distilled smell of a plant suspended in an oil. Incidentally, the essential in the name refers to the fact that it contains the plant's essence, not in the sense of it being indispensable as an oil. Gotcha. Okay. So, and how are they used in aromatherapy? Well, since it's mostly bullshit, there's no one answer to that. Typically, they're put into a nebulizer or diffuser, but they can also be infused in candles or incense, stuff like that. But they're not always burned. Sometimes they're just used topically, like in a massage. Wait, wait let me guess. Then they say that aromatherapy works because people feel more relaxed after that massage. Because the massage is <laughs> relaxing. That, that is one of the ways they justify the existence of this stuff. Yes. And yet, Noah wouldn't let Heath and I go to a spa for massages and mani pedis to investigate for ourselves. <laughs> Coincidence? <laughs> all right. So, is all their evidence that dubious, or is there legitimate evidence for its efficacy? Well, to be honest, that's trickier to answer than it usually is on these segments. Because if you think about it, it's hard to design an essential oil placebo for double-blind testing. The whole point of it is that you have to be able to smell the thing. So you can't have a control group that smells the same thing, but without the active ingredient. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. You can use the same carrier oil and just put in a different but similarly pleasant scent and check the differences between the two. But generally speaking, aromatherapists don't do that. Despite the fact that aromatherapy is something like a $20 billion a year industry, there's remarkably little in the way of high-quality studies. Huh. Most of the studies just use a no-aroma or no-treatment control group, which basically guarantees a study is going to have a positive result. Especially when you're testing subjective things like relaxation and pain being self-reported. Stephen Novella described the state of the research as follows on the Science-Based Medicine blog. Quote, all the individual studies I found had serious methodological flaws. Few are double-blind, some are single-blind, and most are unblinded. The better-designed studies tend to have mixed results and reek of p-hacking, end quote. Okay, sorry, like, uh, for the listener's sake, what does it mean that they reek of p-hacking? Well, Noah, that's what's known as the forbidden aromatherapy, <laughs> and it all starts with some lightly grilled asparagus. No, nope. <laughs> nope, no. He cites one study on whether Rosa Damascena Mill, uh, Damask Rose, is effective in treating migraine headache pain. And this is one of the rare ones that's actually double-blinded. The results of the study are negative. There was no difference in the outcomes for people using Damask Rose oil versus people using the placebo oil. But they do note a difference in hot type of migraines versus cold type of migraines. What does that mean? Go fuck yourself. The study has no idea <laughs> oh. what that means. And neither does Stephen Novella, which is kind of interesting, considering that's literally his area of medical expertise. <laughs> all right. So murder. Uh, is that all there is in terms of research? Well, he also talks about several systematic reviews that put essential oils against various types of pain and not a single one crosses the threshold of evidence where you can definitively show that something works. Basically, they fare as well as acupuncture. So don't work. Okay, so this is a pretty weak defense, but since I'm the one playing devil's advocate, I kind of have to throw it out there anyway. Just because the studies are poorly designed doesn't mean there's no effect to find, right? Like if, if, if your starting point is that big pharma hates essential oils because they 
you know, whatever, they can't put a patent on lavender oil or whatever the fucking scam people claim. You could argue that the reason that you aren't getting good studies is because the best medical research facilities are ignoring the powers of aromatherapy. Yeah, and that's a good argument because I don't know if you guys know this. Nobody's selling essential oil. <laughs> yeah, nobody's so... making any money off this shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be clear, the fact that we don't see good studies doesn't mean they don't exist. Generally speaking, the people funding this research are the people who stand to make the most money from positive results. With alternative medicine modalities, you also have the added ideological motives. So even when you remove the profit motive, you're usually dealing with people or labs that really want alternative medicines to work, and they really want to prove it. But when you review the evidence for something like this, you're not looking at all the studies. You're just looking at the ones that were good enough to publish. When you see something as widely used as aromatherapy and all the studies out there have poor methodology or unconvincing results, you have to assume that there's a huge pile of negative results sitting in shreds in the sub-basement of Goop somewhere. Right. Ugh. God, I hope that's the only thing that's in shreds in the basement of Goop. <laughs> that's the best case scenario. He <laughs> These shreds smell like my vagina. And <laughs> even setting aside the file drawer effect, which is the term for the tendency of negative studies to wind up unpublished, you also have to look at what claims they're testing. I mean, according to the aromatherapists, they've got a whole branch of medicine at their disposal. And yet we don't see tests where you can expect objective results. In other words, they're testing questions like, how relaxed are you? How stressed aren't you? And how did you sleep? They're not testing things like, is the tumor in remission? Or right. do you still have varicose veins? Invariably, when it comes to these kinds of concrete claims, there's no available research at all. All right. Well, but as minor as those might be, like reducing stress and helping people relax does have medicinal value. Sure. Yeah, but that doesn't make the stuff that does that medicine. Laughing reduces stress and helps people relax. But that doesn't mean we're doing like podcast therapy right now if we tell a joke right, and yeah. laugh. Or are we? I'm buying a laptop. Yeah, we're charging a hell of a lot more. <laughs> so, all right, but okay, so but even if it can only moderately reduce your stress or help you relax and and it has no risks, then ultimately it is a net benefit, right? Well, if it had no risks, sure, but that is not the case. For example, people who think they can cure or treat real illnesses with rose-scented oils are more likely to skip or delay real medical care. Right. I even found a story about an ambulance service that was using essential oils as their go-to for minor pain. Oh. The article said they'd use liquid Tylenol if that was not effective, but it means people who were in at least enough pain to call a fucking ambulance had to wait long enough to prove to the EMT that the placebo stupid fucking oil wasn't working and then get real medicine. Right? Wow. Can you think of a scenario more terrifying than climbing into an ambulance at what may be a crippling cost to you and your loved ones and the guy's like, so do you want to try this rose oil first? <laughs> right, yes. We really... <laughs> God. I'm ducking and rolling immediately. <laughs> nope. Mm -mm. Can't charge me. Maybe that pumps up your adrenaline enough in pure rage that <laughs> yeah, you know, like, you that go. takes away some of the pain. I don't know. Rose oil gives people Hulk strength. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's also the problem that this whole thing is poorly regulated, which means you don't always get what the package says in the amount the package claims. And that can be a pretty severe problem when you consider that the essences at the heart of the thing are plant derivatives and lots of plants can be dangerous especially when they're so poorly regulated that the potential allergens listed on the box might not be the only ones in there. But even setting aside allergies, there's at least as much evidence that these highly concentrated oils can irritate your skin as there is that they can improve your relaxation. And irritated skin is a much more subjective thing to measure. And since there's so little regulation, again, you also don't know what kinds of herbicides were used on these plants that the essences were taken from. Okay, uh, so, so does, does that mean that like with better regulation, aromatherapy would be safe? Not necessarily. Many essential oils can be toxic to domestic animals, especially cats. And at high enough levels, they can be toxic to humans as well. There are multiple reports of exposure to essential oils in prepubescent boys causing gynecomastia, which is abnormal non-cancerous enlargement of one or both breasts. So maybe that's what boomboomnatural.com meant by balancing <laughs> your hormones. I don't know. When it hits both breasts, it's balanced. Now, those reports are heavily disputed, 
but they're heavily disputed by the manufacturers of essential oils and, of course, the trade organizations for their suppliers. So, you know, take that however you want. Hmm. I mean, Heath, I have seen your childhood photos. I, I guess my question is, did your mom have essential oils? Because I'm, I'm feeling like cereal season four right now, buddy. Like, let's... Probably. So they can also be <laughs> extremely toxic when taken internally. To be fair, in defense of aromatherapy, I don't like saying that, but that's not how they tell you to take the oil. They don't say do it internally. But according to Wikipedia, quote, doses as low as two milliliters have been reported to cause clinically significant symptoms and severe poisoning can occur after ingestion of as little as four milliliters. So if they're not really effective in treating anything, it's just an extra poison that you're keeping in your home. Wow. No, that's a good point. So is that, um, is that all? Well, okay. I have a bit of an extreme example, but last year, an aromatherapy spray had to be recalled after it was found to be contaminated with Burkholderia pseudomaliae, which is the bacteria that causes melioidosis. That contamination led to four cases of the disease and two deaths from it. So the worst case scenario is the pretty fucking worst case scenario. All right. Well, I suppose the only question left to ask is, how bullshit is it? Okay, it's such bullshit that it's literally tied with sniffing actual bullshit in terms of medicinal value. <laughs> no, it is, though. It is, yeah. All right. Well, on that note, and with the risk of using the echo, I think two times too close together, I suppose our temporary duty as intellectual Febreze is done for the day, but we'll be back with even more nonsense on the next installment of How Bullshit Is It?